Here we have had a number of guests who have represented different perspectives about Judaism, Islam, Israel, Palestine, Jews, Arabs. We've tried to convene opportunities for dialogue, for discussion, for thoughtful analysis, and for encounter. And I expect that this evening will continue that. It's very humbling to be here to introduce uh, Dr. Tafik Hamid. Uh, and the reason is because in, in my job I do a lot of thinking and talking and writing about all sorts of things including uh, the war and terrorism. Um, and here I am with someone who actually has dedicated his life to action in this field. Uh, and I think it's very humbling for all of us to be um, in the vicinity of someone like that. Um, I also find it a very valuable experience because over the eight years I've been a practicing journalist since 9-11, I have read probably thousands of articles by people purporting to explain to me the motivations of terrorists. Uh, and I've probably written a dozen or two myself. Um, and what I've learned over time is that many of these articles are specimens of what psychologists call projection, where you project your own motives on other people. So that if you have a Marxist who's purporting to explain why terrorists attack the West, they'll say, well, it's, it's easy. It's because of poverty. It's because of inequality. It's because we didn't go to Durban. Um, and if you talk to someone who is an enemy of Israel, they say, well, it's, the solution is easy. It's because Israel occupies Gaza and the West Bank, and, and maybe, maybe the entirety of Israel needs to be eliminated to, to eliminate terrorism. And if you talk to George W. Bush, he'll say it's because they hate freedom. If you talk to Noam Chomsky, he'll say it's because of Western imperialism. And the reason these people supply these explanations is because, in many cases, they've dedicated their entire adult life to the underlying cause, and so they think any manifestation of violence anywhere in the world has to be traced to this. And it's this sort of, of, of thinking that uh, Dr. Tafik Hamid is here to address. There aren't many people who have Dr. Hamid's perspective. Um, give you a little bit of background, uh, Dr. Hamid came from a distinguished family in Egypt. Uh, father was in the medical profession and uh, upper middle class family. Um, that, that in itself should tell you something uh, about the relationship between terror recruitment and, uh, and poverty. Um, but uh, studied at university, which of course, as even in this age now, is where many people are radicalized, uh, and came into contact with some very radical influences in Cairo. Uh, and one of them is none other than Ayman al-Zawahiri, who some people in this room may know as the nominal number two uh, man in the, in the Al Qaeda organization, but many people believe to be the true brains, as it were, behind Al Qaeda. Uh, so, and along with uh, maybe one or two others, ranking as perhaps the most infamous terrorist in the entire world. Uh, and Dr. Hamid essentially had an eyewitness uh, perspective on individuals like this, and for a brief time, uh, became attracted to this radical ideology and then pulled back. And in the course of pulling back, uh, became a student of this ideology, realized its lure to millions of young Muslim men around the world, and has now made it his life's work to explain what this threat is and how to combat it. As I said, it's a very rare specimen, someone who could come here and talk with that perspective. Because tragically, once you enter a terrorist organization, it tends to be a lifetime commitment. And there are not many people who come back from this sort of experience. There are not many people who have the strength of character to pull themselves back as an act of ideological will and say, despite all the propaganda I've heard, this is wrong. And I don't know exactly what Dr. Hamid is going to talk about, but I know that like the people in this room, I'm interested, A, to identify what the message was that he was exposed to during this period of radicalism, what were the forces within his character that allowed him to resist it, and how we can create a systematic program around the world 
in Muslim communities, in Muslim countries, that give people the tools to resist this toxic message. And so with that, I give you Dr. Tafiq Hamid. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you tonight. And thank you for this wonderful introduction and for being with us uh, tonight. Um, I don't know really when, where I should start, but I will start with my story. I was born in Egypt, in Cairo, 1961, for a very secular family. My father was an orthopedic surgeon. My mother was a liberal French teacher. My uncle was a movie star. So the whole family was, was, our family was not religious much. My father was an atheist, to be honest with you, and my, my mother was not much interested into the religion. Religion was for us just Ramadan, occasionally, some toys and watching TV, occasional fasting, but not more than this. The first experience in my life that made me in direct touch with the God or the Almighty or the Divine was when I was studying the structure and function of the DNA molecule. It was not through my father, not through traditional teaching. The first time I witnessed the existence of a creator for me was through the DNA molecule. I felt he virtually speaks to me in this molecule. Since then, I developed motivation toward knowing him, searching for him. I just loved him, just simple as that. Unfortunately, this motivation toward God led me to join some Islamic group that what back then was an ultimate dream for you as a Muslim to satisfy God, to satisfy Allah, to join an Islamic group, and it was the Jama'a Islamiyah in our medical school. I will share with you now the brainwashing tactics that they used with me, because it was not only with me, it was with many other students as well. They utilized our motivation toward God, toward serving Him, toward serving the religion, and they direct it in the path of evil instead of path of good. It's like you have a nuclear power. You can give light to a city and you can destroy a city with the same power. This was the energy in me that I wanted to serve God, but how? The first time they invited me to go to pray with them in the mosque, in the medical school, it was Al-Zuhr prayer. We met in front of cadaver room, the anatomy. I met with someone called Mukhtar Mukhtar. He was one of the leaders of the Jama'a Islamiyya. And Mukhtar invited me to the mosque, and while we were walking together, he was walking on my right side, he said to me, look Tawfiq. Actually, he said, look Tariq, because my rare name is Tariq, by the way. He said to me, look Tariq, the most important lesson you need to learn is that Al-Fikru Kufr. Fikr in Arabic, like F-K-R, Kufr, K-F-R. And first one means to think, fikr. Kufr means to become an infidel. So he simply conveyed the message for me that if I started to think, I will be an infidel. So the first thing they did is suppression of my critical thinking. That's why when I talk about solutions for the problem, I developed an educational system for young Muslims to encourage critical thinking because I know what happened to me and I don't want others to go into the same path. So suppression of my critical thinking was the very first step. In fact, he said to me, Mukhtar, I will never forget that day, he said to me, your brain is like like, just like a donkey. If you know the Middle East, a donkey represents what? It's not hard work, it represents stupidity. He said to me, your brain is just like a donkey. The donkey can help you to reach the palace of the, of, or the king or Allah or Islam. When you reach the palace, will you take your donkey into the palace or you leave it outside? I said to him, I leave it outside and then he welcomed me in. So this was the very first thing, suppression of my critical thinking. While I was into the, 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 the mosque itself, 
it was very different from traditional mosques, actually. They asked us to stand in a special way, as if we are at war with someone. Like, they, they, they asked us to stand foot to foot, shoulder to shoulder, as if we are fighting an enemy. And they quoted a Quranic verse that said, Inna Allah yuhibbu alladheena yuqatiluna fi sabilihi saffa. God loves those who fight for his cause. As if they are one cemented structure on one wall. So for even while we are praying or we were praying, they wanted to give us the feeling that we have an enemy there. Gradually, they use also the, the concept of hellfire in a very powerful way. They used to frighten us if we didn't follow what they, what they will tell us in their religion, we will go to hell. And hellfire in... in, in in our culture is not sulfur lake, is not symbolic. Hellfire is a real hellfire. You hear words like Yusabbu min fawqi ru'usihim al hamim. The boiling water will be poured over their heads. Yusharu bihi ma fi butunihim wal jilud. It will dissolve their tissues and their guts. Not only that, kullama nadajat jiluduhum. Whenever their skins are completely cooked and destroyed by the hellfire, baddalnahum jiludan ghayraha liyadhuqu al adab. We will replace it with new skins. So they become retortured again and again and again forever. So it was frightening for us as children, young age, to feel that it will end like this if we didn't follow this. So the power of hellfire was used in the wrong direction. I'm not against hellfire, but I'm, I'm against using it in a wrong direction. Okay? You can tell me if you hated your if you loved your neighbor. You will go to hellfire, and you can tell me if you hated your neighbor, you can go to hellfire. It's again energy, and it depends on how you will direct. To marry in the Middle East, because marriage was very costly for many, and also if even if you have the money, traditionally and culturally, it's unacceptable for a student to marry. So it was very difficult to marry. The concept of having any extramarital relationship is strongly prohibited, and the more you become religion, you know you will go to this hell forever. If you had any relationship, you be have more suppression. Physiological release of sexual desires was even suppressed by many scholars. So on one hand, you have these suppr this suppression, and on the other hand, you read in some books how women will be waiting up there in the paradise, how beautiful they are, with clear description of this beauty. So it creates imbalance in our mind, and I have to admit it, that both myself and many of my fellow people in the Jama'a Islamiyya were ready to die for Allah, to go to paradise just to have sex there. <laughs> And as I summarize it, we had no single reason to stay here, and 72 reasons to go up there. So, so they used it effectively, and I'll give you an example just to prove this, not prove, at least to support this statistically. You know the Sunni and Shia sects in Islam? Uh, if you compare the number of suicide bombing in the Sunni world, or in Iraq, for example, Sunni do most of the suicide bombing compared to Shia. One of the reasons, but not the only reason again, is one of the reasons, is that the Shia have a concept called muta marriage, which is a temporary marriage for enjoyment that can last only one or two hours. Don't ask me how or why, but this is the system there, okay? And it's acceptable in Shia theology. So a young Shia Muslim do not need to, ha to go to paradise to have sex. They can have it here on earth. And this is one of the contributing reasons for the phenomena that's more in the Sunni world. This doesn't mean in any way Shia will not do it. They can do it. Khomeini ordered young Muslims to do suicide bombing. But the difference in the reason, they will not do it for, to have sex in paradise. They will do it because their mullah or marji'iya ordered them to do it. So they can still do it, but for, but for several, for other reasons. After this Discussing this brainwashing tactics, I would like to just to go to the big picture. The big picture is simply what went wrong. Many people ask this question. Professor Bernard Lewis, I shared this discussion with him one day together. What went wrong? And he has a book about what went wrong. Many people wonder why the Middle East, 50 years ago or 60 years ago, Muslims, Jews, Christians used to live together in love and harmony. 
What happened? What happened exactly? Simply three steps. If you lived in this time in the Middle East, you will just summarize what happened in simple three steps. Nothing more than this. Basically, number one, the first step was the rising of the, 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 the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in, in the area. And this, if you want to understand the phenomena here, there were two ways of practicing Islam, at least. At least two major ways. There are many, but at least two. One of them was in Saudi Arabia, which represented what we can call Salafi Islam, typical literal understanding of the religion. And in this part of the world, Jews were were either killed or, or kicked out of the area, Christians the same, they couldn't survive, arts and the music were completely suppressed, uh, women were in complete black and they were not allowed I any rights, it was very tough style or tough way of understanding the religion. In our parts of the world, like outside this area of the desert, we have what we can call Sufi or mixed form of Islam that was relatively tolerant. I cannot claim that it was absolutely tolerant. It was relatively tolerant because still Jews and Christians lived as second class citizens. So I can say it was relatively much more tolerant. They, they survived. Music and art flourished in the area. You hear about belly dancing in Egypt and Lebanon, but I don't think you will hear about belly Saudi dancers. So, so it's, it's, there was huge difference in the two types of practicing the religion. So what happened when Saudi became wealthy in the late 70s because of the petrol, we started to say to one another, look how Allah blessed Saudi with petrol with, and money and wealth because they move the, to, to, and the wealth of petrol to Islam. And that's why some people called it petro-Islam actually. The word petro-Islam described it. So we started to adopt their way of understanding the religion. We, the hijab start to proliferate, we start to suppress women, the desert style of understanding the religion started to dominate the area, and this was the first step. The second step that happened was it was changing the level of jihad. Let me clarify this point because it's vital to understand what happened exactly after we adopted that traditional, that, that Salafi teaching of Islam, or the very radical form of teaching. We changed the level of jihad. So traditionally, in, in, according to Sharia, Muslim nation should declare war on non-Muslim nations to ask them for, to offer them three offers. This is in, in Sharia, not in the Quran, but in general in, in traditional Sharia teachings. To either convert to Islam or to pay humiliating tax called jizya or to be killed. This is the traditional teaching. But it was at nation level. It was not at individual level. So I was supposed as a young Muslim to wait for the Muslim nation to be strong enough to declare war on the West, let's say, and then I can join this army as to do jihad. I was not supposed to attack my fellow Jew or Christians on in the, at individual basis. I shouldn't do it individually. I should wait for the ummah or nation to do it. So we in the Jama'at Islamiya groups and the radical groups, and I witnessed the change myself, changed the level of jihad from nation Responsi level responsibility to individual responsibility. We used some verse in the Quran and some hadith. The verse was saying, فَقَاتِلْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ لَا تُكَلَّفْ إِلَّا نَفْسُكَ Fight for the cause of Allah. You are only responsible for yourself. And they took this verse and they built a whole new theology that jihad now is a personal responsibility. I shouldn't wait anymore for the Muslim ummah or nation to declare war on you. I can do it myself. And this is the origin of what you see all over the world from suicide bombing and small group terrorism. These people want to do jihad, but they, don't, they are not ready to wait for the Muslim nation to do it. They do it themselves. And here is vital to understand the twist of the meaning here of jihad in, in its violent uh, meanings. It can be taught in a peaceful way, but generally they taught it in, in a violent manner. The twist that happened, many people say, oh, they twisted the meaning of jihad. Yes, they twisted it. But the twist was not from a peaceful understanding to a violent one. The twist was from a violent understanding to a barbaric one. That is the difference. So twist happened. I cannot deny it. And I, and I was there in the medical school and other groups 
I witnessed the process of change in the theology itself. After this, so we imported the radical teaching, we changed the level of jihad to make it personal. Instead of me waiting, I will now attack you. And the third step was, with your wonderful immigration policies, you invited many of the jihadists to spread all over the world. So they went to Europe, to America, to Canada, to everywhere. So there were very simple three steps. Saudi wealth and acceptance of this violent form of Islam, changing in the level of jihad, and then spread of the disease. It was as simple as that. Many people think it's complicated. No, it's not. It was not. For me, it was a straightforward issue that was happening. When we talk about the, this phenomena, it's like in science. We have to think what aggravates any phenomena. So that if there is like a diabetic person having a problem now, we should think what aggravates it. Is it obesity? Is it stress? Is it certain medications? Is there an infection? We have to look to the problem in a holistic way and see what aggravates it. So when we talk about Islamic radicalism or terrorism phenomena, there are many things that can aggravate it. One of them is when they feel, that when the radicals feel that you are weak. I'm sure you remember very well the attacks that happened in Kenya and Tanzania on the U.S. embassies. Remember in, in 1998 when they attacked the embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, they killed many people. And the response back then, do you remember if it was strong or weak? Absolutely weak. Yeah. And this just encouraged them to launch another attack which was more powerful. And that is the problem here. You deal with an enemy that if they smell that you are weak, they will just increase their attacks. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. They don't think in the same logic as you think. You need to realize this. The other factor is what is perceived as concession by them. I mean here sometimes certain good things that can happen in the West, but Unfortunately, the radicals perceive them as weakness. I'm sure you remember the cartoon issue of Prophet Muhammad in, in uh, uh, just that happened. And they were published, the par cartoons were published in the, on the 30th of September 2005. Until 30th of January 2006, there were virtually no violent demonstrations all over the world. No violent demonstrations existed in, for four months period. Do you know when violent demonstrations erupted? Can you remember? It erupted less in less than 72 hours after the magazine in Denmark apologized. Just imagine, for four months period, I, I cannot blame them for the apology, they are decent people. But I want to emphasize that it's important to weigh our decisions and our words and our responses to terrorism in a way that does not encourage them to, 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 to actually launch more attacks. So we need to, to be very careful about the balance between being decent and being perceived as weak. We need this delicate balance between being decent and polite and, and, all, and also keeping in our mind not to be perceived as weak. Because the moment you are perceived as weak, they actually think to attack you again to get more concessions from you. When the third factor that aggravates the problem, in my view, is justification. When people mention this issue of poverty, I, I really enjoyed listening to the list of things you mentioned. Poverty, lack of democracy, lack of education, and all this interesting stuff that they never contributed to my radicalization process, to be honest with you. When we talk about poverty, we can see Bin Laden was a billionaire, and, and Al-Zawahri was from a wealthy family. I myself was not from a poor class at all. And many, the neurosurgeon in England, Nadal Hassan and the young terrorists in, in Virginia recently, some of them in the dentistry school, so none of them was complaining of severe poverty. But I cannot deny that there is a relationship between poverty and terrorism, but it's, it's the opposite of what we think. It's terrorism that brought, brings poverty. Let us assume if the terrorists stop doing terrorism in Iraq, what can happen in the economy? The same in Gaza. And the Palestinians, if they become poor, because the economy goes down, people do not want to invest. Investors leave the area. 
So when this happens, poverty is aggravated. When poverty is aggravated, it becomes easier to recruit. I cannot deny theological. So poverty, when, when you see reality, that in, in, in the statistical reality that majority of the terrorists were from m middle class to high class families, then you can realize it's not the cause. Also lack of education. Most of them were highly educated as we have seen. Lack of democracy. Terror, terrorism and homegrown radicalism occurred in London, in Canada here, in US. Are you telling me this is because of lack of democracy in these parts of the world? And there is more important question. If poverty and lack of education and lack of democracy and American foreign policy were the true cause of radicalism and terrorism, why these factors do not affect non-Muslims who live in the same socio-economic circumstances to the same degree as they affect Muslims? Tell me why Christians in the Middle East who are subject to lack of democracy, poverty, the same levels of education, do not become suicide bombers. Why? If the cause was these factors, it shouldn't distinguish between a Muslim or a Christian. It should affect both of them. So we know that obviously the cause, when you, people in, insist that the cause is poverty, the cause of lack of democracy, actually you encourage the jihadists to do to do more attacks because they feel that, oh, whatever we will do, these people will always find justification for us. But the most critical one that, was, that is always mentioned is the Arab-Israeli conflict. And let me ask one question here. Can any sane individual on this globe convince me that killing more than 150,000 innocent Algerians butchering their infants in front of their eyes, and Sunni killing Shia in Iraq with no mercy and mutilating the de their dead bodies, exploding the mosques of Shia in Pakistan, exploding funerals of their fellow Muslims. If the Arab-Israeli conflict was the cause, why Muslims are killing one another? <laughs> Just tell me. Why they explode the funerals and mosques and markets of their fellow Muslims? So I think we have to think deeply about this. And when it comes to the issue of Israel, uh, when I was young, I was always thinking that, or seeing that there are queues of Palestinians standing interested to go and work in Israel. I haven't seen queues of the Israeli Arabs trying to leave it. If Israel was such an apartheid state that discriminate against the Arabs and hate them and humiliate them as the Arab media always promote, why we haven't seen Israeli Arabs trying to escape from this hell and to, to outside, to other parts of the world? Have you ever heard a Jew or Jews standing in queues to go to Germany during the Nazi? Never. It was the other way around, the escape. So for those people who claim that Israel is like the Nazi and apartheid state and all this stuff, I say to them, this is unfair. This is truly unfair because when you see the reality, the reality is that thousands of Palestinians were always interested and are always interested to go there in Israel to work. If Israel was such a bad country, this wouldn't have happened. And we would have seen the opposite. We would have seen thousands of Palestinians standing in the opposite queues, leaving Israel to the Arab world. <laughs> the third element that I would like to raise about the Arab-Israeli conflict in this context is that I visited Israel several times. The first thing I remember when I went to the airport is the word Al Salam, peace in Arabic. I was surprised. Then I went with the, in, the, in, in the car and I realized that the street signs are all written in Arabic as well, in addition to Hebrew and English, Arabic. I got some of the shit to myself. If this great country is doing this for this minority, the Arab minority, as a matter of respect and to make their life easier, how come some people blame it of discrimination or racism? I think these people should look to themselves first before blaming Israel. <laughs> the 
There are many things to talk about in this issue, but I would like to mention briefly some elements of what we can call reformation within Islam and how we can address this problem differently, how, how we can move from there. I'm not coming here just to tell you there is a problem. No, I'm coming here to tell you that there is a solution also. And let us talk, the solution can be complex. I will not go into the details of the whole strategic plan that I developed for solving the problem, but I will talk specifically about the use of religion. In which direction? Can you use religion to make people love one another instead of hate one another? Let me share with you a personal story. When I was young, I was reading in the Quran after Al-Asr prayer, the third prayer in the day, and I read a verse that said, فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ وَجَدْتُمُوهُمْ Kill the infidels wherever you find them. I just, my conscience couldn't accept it. Especially my neighbor was a wonderful Christian lady, her name was Auntie Fauzia, and she was so kind to me, and she used to love me, and, and I just couldn't take it. So I went to a Salafi friend called Adel Saif. I remember him very well. And I said to him, Adel, would you mind to just to tell me the explanation, interpretation of this verse? He said to me, ah, we have to fight all these people, but we have to prepare for this. Just don't, just you have to wait and prepare for them. And he showed me a lot of references in the Sharia books to justify the concept of fighting the infidels. I still didn't feel satisfied. So I went to a Sufi scholar, a wonderful human being, called Sufism is a sort of mystical Islam. True and the pure Sufis are good people, not the mixed ones, the real ones, they are good people. And his name was Sheikh Shaban, an old man in another mosque. I said to him, Sheikh Shaban, can, can you kindly help me with this verse? Kill the infidels wherever you find them. And Sheikh Shaban, I still remember the moment he pat me on my shoulder like this, and he said to me, my son, just love every human being and be good with every human being. I said to him, but Sheikh Shaban, it, the verse is in the Quran, what can I do? He said to me, يَوْمَ يَأْتِي تَأْوِيلُ It's a verse in the Quran which means, in the day of judgment, you will understand the meaning. So, so, Sheikh Shaban was very kind a human being, I cannot deny this, yet he couldn't give me a theologically based answer, and I was in trouble. If I asked my father who was an atheist and his friends, I don't think they would be able to give me an answer for an interpretation for a verse. So I had three options now, like, or at least two options. One of them is the one who is using it literally and having a lot of theological support. Another one who has a good heart, but he didn't give me the theological support. And for this particular reason, I followed the radicals for some period in my life. So what happened here is the lack of theological base for teach for within Islam to teach values of, of peace and to stand against the violent edicts of Sharia laws was fundamental, fundamental. To, to make change in my life. And that is why I feel responsible for doing the opposite. So when I left the Jama'a Islamiyya, and if I come the moment I left it, when, when they actually asked me to materialize the theoretical violence into, into reality, they asked me to share with them in kidnapping a police officer dig, from Egypt and digging a grave for him beside the mosque and, and burying the man al alive in, in the grave. So they asked me to share in this. This was totally, absolutely beyond my, my conscience to accept. And I started to think and I rejected their teaching from now on through another story. But what I want to say here is that during my journey, I developed a complete new interpretation or commentary for the Quran that can give young Muslims the theological base for peaceful understanding of the religion. Like, for example, this particular verse, فَاقْتُلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَيْثُ Kill the infidels wherever you find them. I notice that all the violent verses in the Quran that talks about war use the expression al-kafirin, which means the infidels. It's like if I told you I'm going to, to a white house, or well, any white house, but if I said to you I'm going to the white house, that's very different. 
then you can specify the meaning in time and the place to particular group of people. So by noticing or observing this L or that at the beginning of the, in the, in the violent verses, nearly all, in fact, all the violent texts about wars can be limited in time and the place to specific group of people in the early stages of Islam and cannot be implemented in our modern times against anyone. So simple observations like this can make huge difference. And, and also I developed an educational system that uses cognitive psychology to, to solve the problem. I'm a medical doctor basically, but I have degrees in cognitive psychology as well. I developed a model of learning called the multidimensional learning model that uses cognitive psychology to facilitate the process of learning. So one of the things I did is I incorporated this in theology and education for young Muslims. I developed the system. I'll share one example with you briefly. I noticed that one of the main problems that we have in the Muslim world is what I can call suppression of human conscience. They tell us that if something is halal or permissible, halal means permissible, you can do it. So people can go do polygamy, beating women, stoning women, whatever they like. They, Bin Laden can behead human beings thinking that it is halal, it is permissible by Allah, by God. Why should he think twice? God himself permitted it. So it is absolutely halal, permissible, they go for it. Haram means not permissible. So when we judge things without using our human conscience, when we judge things by saying, oh, it is halal, I can do it, we gradually suppress our human conscience, and at the end you, you, you have this kind of people who can do anything, any evil and violent thing, without feeling that they are doing something wrong. So to, to make the conscience of our human conscience work, I give some examples. Can you give me this cup of water, please? Just because I, no, 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 just the, don't feel it, it's fine for me. I will use it as an example. I, in, <laughs> oh, I can drink some as well. <laughs> so I, I draw a cup of water for them in my educational system. And I say to the children, is drinking this water now halal or haram, permissible or not permissible? They say, oh, halal, what's wrong? Drinking water, it's not alcohol even, it's water. Halal, permissible. Then I say to them, imagine if there is a human being right now dying of thirst and dehydration. And if you drank this water, he will die or she will die. And if you gave it to him or her, he will live or she will live. And then I ask the question again, is drinking this water now halal or haram? Permissible or not permissible? Some human being will die now. They say not permissible. Then I give theological support for this by quoting a verse in the Quran that actually the, the verse quoted the Torah, which was very interesting. I'm quoting it from the Quran, but the verse quoted the Torah in the statement that said, whoever gave life to any human being as if he gave life to all mankind. So I'm sure Rabbi is there in the Torah. So we have the same one in the Quran quoted from you. So I give theological support. So when you see here, I, I'm actually having a war with the radicals, but not with military. It's at the mind level. The radicals suppress critical thinking. I'm trying to make the children think to generate the fact, not just follow blindly. The radicals use rote learning, which is just to memorize and rehearse and, and repeat things. I'm trying to use visual images and pictures so that the images remain better or more, become more consolidated in their mind. I would like to raise a very important issue that we need to, to understand it. That this war is not a war between Israel and the Arabs, or between the West and, and, and the Arab world or Islam. It is a war between civilization and barbarism. A war between love. We either win this war or we will lose our civilization. When I remember the word civilization and how we can lose it, I would like to conclude with, with, with a small poem that I wrote one day for a wonderful human being. I'm sure many of you will know him. His name was Daniel Peer. You remember Daniel Peer? 
a Wall Street journalist who was beheaded, kidnapped, and beheaded in Pakistan in a very barbaric manner. He was the first, and, and I couldn't sleep the night. The whole image and the smile, when you see the smile of Daniel Pierce, it tells a story. It tells a story, his smile. I couldn't sleep, and I wrote some few words for him that I would like to share with you now. I said to him, Daniel, I will quote it in Arabic first and translate. أقسم أني لن أترك اسمك يمحى من ذاكرة التاريخ. I swear, I swear that I will never let your name to be erased from the memory of history. وسأكتب اسمك بالدمع and I will write your name with my tears. وسأحفر اسمك في الصخر and I will carve your name at the top of the mountains so that everybody will see it. فما قتلوك وحدك يا دانيال They haven't only killed you, O oh Daniel. بل قتلوا الحق وقتلوا الحب وقتلوا أحلام الأجيال. But they killed the meaning of love, the meaning of truth, and the dreams of the coming generations. Qasaman. Qasaman bi'aninika waqt al-dabhi. I swear with your groaning pains when they slaughtered you. Wa bidam'i tiflika fi al-rahimi. And I swear...